For Janice Tisdale, December 23rd started as a day like any other. This San Antonio realtor had a busy day planned, which included a property showing with the client. I knew I was going to show him property at 1 o'clock, so I got up, I made my appointments at um, Centralized Showing, and then I had some things to do at the office, so I ran to the office and did a couple of things. And then he called me and said, oh, by the way, I'm running, my airplane is running late into San Antonio. Uh, instead of meeting at 1, can we meet at 1.30? So I said, fine. So I just ran and did a Christmas errand. Everything seemed quite normal. You know, we went in and out of the rooms. We talked about the house. And then he said, well, you know, I think I really want to go see that other house. So I said, okay, just follow me. And so he hopped in his car and I hopped in mine. And we got to the second house. And I opened it up and because he wanted to know about taxes. And he wanted to know when the house had been first put on the market or some question that I didn't have with me. And so I, I called my office, I spoke to uh, an agent, and um, we started walking around the house, and he just was taking so much time. I always made him go in front of me, and I wasn't feeling like when we went up the stairs, something just made me not feel comfortable, and I made him walk in front of me. He went into the bedrooms, I stayed out in the hallway, and then when we went down the stairs, he went first, I went second, and then all of a sudden, he just went off and disappeared. Something just told me, don't go follow him. So I just stayed in the kitchen. In fact, I even walked to the front door, opened the front door up, and just I was just feeling uncomfortable. I kind of stayed towards the front door, and I didn't go back. I just said to him, I go, Emil, uh, it's 3 o'clock. I've got another client. I really need to get going. Are we almost done here? And then he came walking out of the back part of the house, which was the master bedroom side of the house. And he goes, well, you know, I really want this house. And I said, well, you know, we can um, write a contract on it. And about 15 minutes before that, when before he went off and disappeared for 15 or 20 minutes, he had asked me, what time does my bank close? And I thought that was kind of weird. And I said, oh, well, my bank closes at 3 o'clock. But we had been talking about cashier's checks and so on, so I just put it back in my memory that, oh, he probably just wanted to know what time do banks close, how late could he get a cashier's check. And I said, oh, don't worry about a check, you can get it to me the next day. He went out the door first, and I thought he started down the stairs, and I went to shut the door and turn the key because I always leave the key in the door when I show houses, just my habit. And then I bent down because it wasn't a super key, it was a combination lock and I had laid it on the ground and um, when I bent down to pick up the combination, then he whacked me over the head. And I just go, what the heck did you just do? Why did you hit me? I was like angry. And I just, you know, I just go, why did you do that to me? And he goes, well, I need $4,000. Well, when he said he needed $4,000, then the bell went off in my head. And I went, oh, no wonder he asked me what time my bank closed. And so we sat, stood on the porch. My head was bleeding profusely. And I had a 
like a sweatsuit on and I took the jacket off and put it on top of my head. And he wasn't going to let me do that. And he goes, what are you doing? And I go, well, you know, my head is bleeding really bad. I have to put something on my head. So I put the jacket on my head and I had my cell phone in my pocket. So I just put my hand in my pocket because my keys were on my arm and I just kept trying to dial numbers, hoping somebody would answer and hear me. I just stood on the porch and I just kept saying to him, you don't want to kill me. Don't kill me. All you've done is hit me over the head. So why don't you just let me go and just go on about your day? No one's ever going to know you hit me. I'm not going to tell anyone. Well, he had on these really dark Ray-Ban sunglasses and I couldn't see his eyes. And I just kept saying, take your glasses off. Look me in the eye. I am a good person. I'm not going to tell anyone. You just need to take your glasses off. I go, I don't have $4,000. And then why I said this, I'll never know. I said, if you wait till Monday, I have a closing and I could get you $4,000, but I don't know why I said it, but I was trying to say anything to keep him focused on, you know, not hitting me again. And so then a UPS truck came by and I raised my jacket up and he goes, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, I'm adjusting my jacket because his back was turned to the street so he couldn't see what, why I was doing this. And the UPS truck went on by. said, I'm not going to tell on you. Just go to your car, get a piece of paper, and I'll write a note. And he goes, no, I'm going to take you to the hospital. And I go, no, you're not. I said, you, I will never, never get in your car because you will kill me. And I will never get in your car. Now, you just need to go get this piece of paper. I was very, very assertive with him. I was a flight attendant, and we went through a lot of training about how to deal with unruly people or hijackers or whatever. And I swear that just must have kicked right in. And at one point I started to cry because my head was bleeding so bad. And he goes, shut up, you're crying. You know, he said a few choice words to me. And I said to myself, Janice, you know not to cry. Just suck it up and just, you know, remain calm. And so I just kept saying to him, go to your car, get a piece of paper. raised my jacket up and I turned my head towards the street and waved furiously because I couldn't tell if he was looking at me or not. So I just said, what the heck? I'm just going to do this. And they went on by. And so he must not have noticed what I did. And he goes, okay, I'm going to go get a piece of paper. turned around, he walked down the steps, and as soon as he got into his car and sat on his seat, I had been trying to unlock my car because I had my car keys in my hand, but I decided at that point our cars were too close together and that I wouldn't have enough time to get into my car and shut it, and so I ran. Well, I probably would have had a better chance to get in my car because I was very weak because I'd been bleeding for over 45 minutes. And I ran across the street to the corner, and then here he comes after me. 
Well, he catches me and he grabs me really tight on my arm and he's dragging me back across the street and I'm just screaming. All of a sudden, here come those kids and they got right to the corner and they had their window down and I was screaming, help me, help me. And they slammed on their brakes and five teenagers bounded out of this little tiny Honda Civic and they told him to back off and I of course jerked away from him. I'm sure he was totally startled by five, there were four boys and one girl. And so I ran to their car and I just said, get me out of here, get me out of here, he's trying to kill me, please get me out of here. And so at that point, I didn't know he said this to the kids, but they told me this, that he said to them, she just robbed me and I'm just trying to protect myself. And one of the kids said, whatever. Got to uh, the high school and we, I got out of the car. Of course, I was sitting on the laps of one of the boys because there were five kids in this little tiny Honda. So we jumped out of the car and I said to the police officer, I've just been assaulted by one of my clients and for some reason I look up and there he was at the stop sign. Well, he must have taken off after us, you know, because we jumped into our car, then he had to go get into his car. And so he must have been chasing us, but a pickup truck was behind us. And as we turned into the school, he must not have seen us turn in and he was at the stop sign and this pickup truck was first and he was behind the pickup truck. And I said to the police officer, there he is in that grayish green Mercedes, he's right there. And so the police officer jumped back in his car and took pursuit and caught him in like four or five blocks. If the kids had not have come by, I'm sure he would have killed me because later we found out that in his car, he had a 14 inch hunting knife and he had rope and twine, and he had a plat of the subdivision. So I'm sure that when I didn't pass out when he hit me, that that's what really shocked him, you know, uh, that I was still awake and alive because he wanted money and, um, you know, I don't know what he would have done, but we, the police officers think he was definitely going to kill me, so. You don't just pick up million dollar buyers. They usually come recommended to you. And um, he was working with one of my husband's very, very good friends. And this man, um, Stevie, was, selling, was going to build for him a seven story pharmaceutical building on Santerra Boulevard. And the first time I showed him houses, I was a little leery of the possibility that he really could afford a house like this because um, I always look at two things shoes and teeth for people I don't know why but I do and he had really really rotted out teeth and uh, so I asked uh, Stevie are you sure this guy can afford a house like this and he goes oh yeah uh, he's been verified by a hedge fund and he told us he was on some kind of chemo treatment that had made his teeth rot out and he had a story for everything and uh, I just didn't have a reason to be afraid. Mm -hmm. And uh, his money had been verified. I didn't get a pre-approval letter, but you know, supposedly he had billions of dollars. That's what I was told. So I felt comfortable working with him. And then we had actually written a contract for one of the two houses. Mm -hmm. And uh, the house where I was assaulted, we had written a contract for. And, but it was a foreclosure. And two things with foreclosures, cashier's check and proof of funds. And I told him that I could not turn in this contract until he had given me both of those items. Well, he never provided them to me. So I was very busy in December and I just didn't have time to go chasing him around. He would make a phone call to me and say, 
oh, I'm going to this and I'm going to that. And I just would say, okay, just when you get me the money, I'll turn the contract in. So then, you know, at first I thought, well, it's not even worth bothering with him. And then my husband's friend said, we verified his funds. And I had even tried to Google him, trying to find out bad or good, just Google him. And I never could find out anything about him. And I thought that was kind of strange, someone who was supposed to have billions of dollars that you couldn't even, you can Google my name and find out a lot. I think that we all have to realize that it's really not about the almighty dollar because when you get an, uh, the normal house we sell are 100 to 200,000 and to each realtor that has a chance to sell a million dollar house, we go woohoo and I think we have to be careful with everyone but uh, we, we just can't let our guard down because someone has become recommended and because we think we're going to sell them a million dollar house and because they drive a Mercedes, we have to keep our guard up for everyone. It doesn't matter who it is. We are very vulnerable. I mean, we go into these empty houses every day and 99% of the time, our clients don't even come recommended. Their phone duty are a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend has said, oh, you ought to go use Janice Tisdale. She's a great realtor. Well, most of the time they can't even remember who recommended them to you. So I've just become a lot more cautious. I think it's really important to get that proof of funds. I don't care if they're cash buyers or not, they still should go to a mortgage person. And that I'm not showing houses by myself right now, but eventually I will get back into it, I hope, you know. But if I do go show a house, someone at my office knows where I am. I call them as soon as I arrive. I call them as soon as I leave and uh, they call me. Um, it's just our safety is a real issue and we just have to be so much more cautious because I think the society is such an instant, you know, they, they pick up the phone and they go, I want to see your listing at 7 Benchwood. I want to see it right now. And we just go because we're so afraid that we're going to lose them as a client. And I just think we have to take a step back. I'm not a, I'm not a first timer. I've been doing this a long time, and I thought I did the right things. I made my appointments, someone knew who he was, I took my own car, I called someone from my office. I did all the right things, but there I was in this situation. And so it's just, you know, even though we think we're doing the right things, sometimes bad things happen to you. so proud of these five young people uh, that they stopped and helped me and they could have driven on by and I think it just lifts my heart to know that there really are great young teenagers, young adults out there that are willing to help. One of them said, I go, you're my hero and he goes, Mrs. Tisdale, I just did what my parents taught me to help people. And he goes, I'm not a hero. I just did what was expected of me. And it's just wonderful to know that there really are people out there. Because without them, I, I probably wouldn't be sitting here talking to you today.